My pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Julio Jayetta. Dr. Jayetta is the Professor of Molecular and Cellular Oncology at MD Anderson Cancer Center and the Director of the MD Anderson Institute for Applied Cancer Science. Good morning, and, and thank you, Michael and Tyler, and uh, for inviting me here today. It's a pleasure to be back in Boston always and to see many uh, old friends. I'll try a triple somersault today as I'm going to talk about pancreas, I'm going to talk about tumor initiating cells, I'm going to talk about tumor metabolism, which are three areas that I know nothing about. But uh, as often happens, um, you have some incredibly talented people joining your lab, and uh, um, so I'll describe the work by Andrea Viale and uh, much of the work that is taking place at the Institute of uh, Applied Cancer Science uh, in the development of a novel inhibitor of oxidative phosphorylation. So I'll tell you two, talk about two unpublished stories. Uh, before getting into that, um, I just want to reflect on a couple of things that I think were mentioned already by Michael particularly. I mean, this is the situation where you really uh, can see that there is impact. Um, and this comes as a result of a translocation. This is specifically work that Alice Shaw and others have, have, have described in the de development of Chrysotony, as an inhibitor of ALK in uh, this particular condition. But uh, what we're learning more and more as we approach the issue of the complexity of cancer is that these driver mutations that are directly targetable don't come around as often as one would like to see them. In fact, when Linda Chin and I uh, joined forces into uh, uh, approaching this Institute of Applied Cancer Science, first in Boston and now at MD Anderson, the idea was that we were going to create a, you know, an opportunity for immediate translation that would be coming from discoveries like the BRAF mutations and have next to them a group that could really implement drug discovery. But in fact, the functional validation of, of cancer genome is more about context and approaches that allow to identify particular vulnerability of cancer cells versus the obvious situation where you have a, a clearly a driving mutation in front of you. And as you know, many of these responses uh, uh, end up being transient anyway. And, and so we have to really think differently about the problem. This without, while emphasizing that, of course, targeted therapies or many of those compounds that Michael was mentioning have really fared better uh, compared to conventional therapies. So the percentage of drugs that have been approved compared to traditional therapies over the years, uh, have fared, you know, have, this has worked much better. Uh, these are statistics for drugs that entered the uh, clinical trials between 2004 and 2005, and they were full until uh, April 2011, and we keep monitoring some of these things. But essentially, there are multiple reasons for failures and also opportunities for changes in the way we approach the problem. Uh, the biology clearly uh, is, uh, uh, has affected us. Our under lack of understanding of the depth of uh, uh, alterations that take place in cancer and the multiple mechanisms that ensure cancer cell survival um, uh, has limited our, our progress, and we were really naive when, uh, you know, during the 90s and, and uh, started to develop, for example, kinase inhibitor, assuming, for, for example, if you were to develop a MET inhibitor and then Aurora inhibitor and CDK inhibitor and so on and so forth, that you would see significant impact in the absence of knowing really the underlying uh, overall uh, causes uh, of the problem and what's required for tumor maintenance. Um, the, clearly, the development of the list is going to uh, help us, but most importantly, we really need to take a different approach. And many of the things that you will hear about today deal with this whole issue of targeting the tumor as a whole and really thinking about uh, um, as a can, not tumors as a problem of an organ, 
uh, in its own context as opposed to specifically looking and solely looking at the cancer cell or as a, in, a, in a context of a cell autonomous um, system. And one thing that's clearly important is also this last point, the fact that the drug discovery and development uh, and so the, this whole translation uh, piece has really been sandwiched between, uh, uh, between the academic course that take care either of discovering uh, mechanisms or implementing clinical trials approaches. And often what has happened is that uh, scientists in industry would take some of these publications or would talk uh, with scientists and meetings and so on and then implement their own um, pipeline of uh, drugs and diagnostic approaches and then go back to academia essentially testing clinicians, uh, asking clinicians in, in the various clinics and various institutions to perform clinical trials for them without really uh, uh, having kept in touch during that time to be able to really figure out what the best approach would be. And again, this becomes extremely important because this translation piece is that is very, very is essential for success. And it requires a different level of commitment from both sides and really wanted to be stringent around the clinical pathological validation of the hypothesis and the ability to seek impact in preclinical models in a different way than what's been done in the past. Simply looking for uh, you know, impact on a simplified xenograft model, impact on growth is not sufficient to actually warrant uh, you know, the initiation of a clinical trial. You really have to work differently and unfortunately, what we see more and more is that, you know, basic scientists continue to be solely rewarded by uh, the ability to push forward novel concepts. And of course, because, you know, the next paper, once you discover that a particular phenomenon occurs and you describe it for the first time, you don't get a lot of, you know, a lot of recognition in the next paper that continues to go deeper in the story and you move on, particularly those, those labs that, that are trend setting tend not to, uh, to ignore completely the need for translational research. So, so there is lack of commitment from the basic research side and there is an enormous naivete from uh, the people that normally work in industry to really put forth uh, 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 a significant effort in this direction. And just to talk about complexity today, I'll, I'll clearly describe uh, a, a story that deals uh, specifically with, with, with pancreas cancer and, and tries to understand context in this particular situation. Um, so uh, I've talked about this. I can just probably switch to the story itself. So this is a story, as I mentioned, that was started by Andrea uh, Viale uh, and MD Anderson. And it's about, uh, it really started with uh, assessment of the impact of extinguishing RAS in tumors using one of the inducible models that have been uh, developed for uh, uh, Keras uh, reversible in, uh, induction. And really trying to figure out if there are cells that are left behind, how do we approach the problem? What we clearly know from, from this model, this is a model developed by Alec Kimmelman and uh, Hao Chang Yin in, in Ron, the Pinos lab, um, uh, what we've started to see in this model that while there is absolute dependency for growth, so when you switch off RAS cells uh, and tumors disappear, there is, um, after four to five months, the tumors will reappear again in the absence of RAS induction. And some of the, the tumors, of course, will have reactivated through uh, uh, genetic rearrangement KRAS expression, but you still have tumors that reappear without RAS. So the question is, as it is in the case of when we look at what's happening clinically uh, with the um, uh, clinical course of um, treatment with uh, BRAF inhibitors, if you want in melanoma or other conditions, EGFR and so on, is that um, you uh, actually see impressive responses, uh, but then tumors will reappear. And so then, the, and then you can challenge them with additional agents, as people are, are showing, I'm sure it's, it's possible that, that Neil will talk about this today. But still the question is, what's left behind and why are these, these cells dying? And you can advocate all sorts of biodistribution issues and possibility that all cells are reached by the, by the drug, but there could be a, a different underlying biology, and this is the question we've been trying to ask. And what we really saw uh, uh, when we started to do this is that tumors, once you switch off RAS, um, don't completely disappear. You see that there are uh, islets of cells that uh, remain in the tumors. They don't divide, but they are sitting there, and they're not dying, and these are weeks. Uh, and even months after treatment. 
And um, to be able to study this system, uh, we actually were able to establish uh, sphere-type cultures, uh, 3D cultures uh, from the pancreas tumors. And uh, establish this is, establishing this system, then we could actually do reversible induction in vitro as well as in vivo. And so if you look, for example, at the in vitro system, you take these uh, uh, tumors out of uh, uh, the mouse and you grow them in the presence of doxycycline, so RAS is activated. They grow uh, up to uh, reaching uh, a, a sphere of about 400 cells. If you um, switch off uh, and put these cells in doxycycline, most of the cells actually die, and, uh, um, and you see these, uh, these remnants, and you can bring back doxycycline, and you will see uh, you know, regrowth of whatever is left. So this sort of mimics the situation that we have been characterizing in, in vitro, and you could do this in vivo as well, and, we'll, and you will see the same, uh, the same phenomenon, uh, RAS plus, eliminate RAS, restore RAS. And, um, you know, I don't need to go into very much detail, but essentially you do see inactivation of RAS through biochemical means, as well as its downstream signaling, like ERK, phosphorylation, and so on. As soon as you reactivate RAS, you're actually then reactivating a proliferative uh, context, as shown here also by expression of doxycycline. The uh, surviving cells actually seem to express stem cell uh, markers. Uh, this is some of the histology with CD44 and CD133, where you see positivity. Uh, and this is also uh, looking at this by, by flow cytometry. And if, if you look at um, uh, the same uh, context with the markers, um, you see that there is an enrichment. Uh, uh, you, know, you have these cells that are dying from uh, apoptosis as a result of the uh, switching off KRAS. Um, and these cells are actually enriched for these markers, the CD133, uh, CD144. As shown here, so it seems like there is a protected population that survives KRAS extinction. As soon as you activate KRAS, as I mentioned before, you see that uh, the cells actually very rapidly, within 48 hours, are rolled back into the cycle. So they are quiescent, but then reactivated uh, uh, cell proliferation. And um, when we look at it from a, a functional perspective, these cells, in fact, have uh, are highly enriched in tumor initiating cells. So there is a population that is protected after KRAS inactivation, remains quiescent. Uh, you can take these cells, reimplant them, reactivate KRAS, and show uh, that in fact the tumor initiating frequency is highly uh, enhanced. Now the question is, of course, if, if there were to be translational relevance to this, could we actually verify whether by treating with signal transduction inhibitors, we could mimic a similar phenotype. Of course, we don't have drugs today that directly block KRAS. And in fact, we saw that this is in fact the case. So if you use a combination of a MEK inhibitor and of mTOR PI3 kinase inhibitor in these uh, spheroid assays, we can actually increase um, the tumor initiating cell frequency quite a lot. Um, and so what I've shown you thus far is that a subset of cells with features of tumor initiating cells seem to be able to survive the ablation, either genetically or chemically induced of oncogenic pathways. So this is really what started us then in trying to understand what's going on in these cells and how are they able to survive. And uh, by performing gene expression profiles of the D2 populations, again, I, I would point out that these populations that we analyze are actually quiescent. So we take the fully formed spheres from the KRAS, uh, uh, you know, the tumors grown in presence of, of KRAS, uh, and compare them to the remnants that are surviving in the absence of KRAS. So there is no impact of any cell cycle um, differential mechanisms. And what we compare this, we see that there is an enrichment in electron transfer chain by the oxidation and lysosome and autophagy. And uh, this is at the level of uh, microarrays. Here is some of the validation with, uh, with uh, PCR. And we also see, for example, that uh, uh, mitochondria regulators like PGC1 alpha are upregulated compared to the KRAS cells. Um, there is a long list of, of, uh, of, of genes that come up as a result of this, again, from electron transfer chain regulation, mitochondria, and autophagy. 
This is some of uh, um, the validation that can be done in the, in, uh, when treating, rather than with RAS extinction, with uh, signal transduction inhibitors, you see the same uh, induction of PGC1, alpha, and beta, and uh, you see the same regulation downstream of, of this. And um, what was interesting to see that is, in fact, the surviving cells have an increase in mitochondria as measured by the abundance of these uh, channels with ac one uh, or with mitotracker. Um, in uh, um, immunofluorescence, we see a similar phenotype. Here you have staining for DAPI, CD44, and with ac one and uh, um, the uh, surviving cells in the absence of Keras have a much stronger staining for, for mitochondria. And if you look at actual mitochondrial staining, uh, in the absence of Keras, you see very distinct uh, um, structural changes in, in, the, in the mitochondria. Um, uh, and um, you look at autophagy, you also see that there is a, quite a significant induction of autophagy in the remnants. Um, you know, this is an, uh, an enlargement of, of the Manus Keras, you see. Uh, and in fact, we have evidence of microlipophagy. Um, we, we also see, um, you know, very increased effects. And um, uh, the other thing that we really see an increased lipid accumulation, so these are neutral lipids in the absence of Keras. The way I'm thinking about this right now is that as a result of the, so the KRAS cells are in a very active anabolic state. The moment you switch off KRAS or block cell signaling, um, you're really turning them and putting them into a catabolic state. And you seem to induce phenomena that are, allowing, that are, are there to allow the cell to cope with this excess nutrient uh, uh, and this shutdown of the anabolic pathway. Uh, the mitochondria might be required not just for energy um, consumption, uh, but really uh, for energy generation, but uh, to be able to cope with the catabolic events. Um, there is a number of slides here that, that really highlight the, um, you know, the connections with the functional uh, phenomena. You see that uh, you have an increased oxygen consumption in the uh, upon uh, shutdown of KRAS. Um, you see that there is an increased uh, polarization of mitochondria upon switching off KRAS. Uh, although there seems to be already a, a subpopulation of cells in the uh, KRAS positive uh, population. Uh, that uh, seems to have hyperpolarized mitochondria. So this might be interesting because it would suggest that some of these cells pre-exist. Um, you have an induction of uh, ROS, as you might expect, as a result of this. So um, there is an increase in mitochondrial activity uh, in, uh, in these cells. And then we were really interested in the question of whether we should, you know, there should be a way of targeting these cells selectively. Um, again, from a metabolic standpoint, we see uh, several alterations in metabolic pathways as a result of the inactivation of KRAS, and particularly we see an impairment of glycolysis. So this is sort of corroborated by what we know about KRAS and induction of uh, aerobic glycolysis. You shut down this pathway, you see down regulation of these metaboli metabolites, and we've done a number of flux experiments that I'm not showing you that actually corroborate our data. It seems like the uh, KRAS minus cells have a very, very uh, uh, enhanced uh, oxidative phosphorylation uh, through mitochondrial uh, activation activity. And they seem to be working, uh, the mitochondria seem to be working at their maximum rates. This is actually uh, the plot uh, that you normally see of oxygen consumption rate in the, when, you, when you start blocking mitochondrial function and then uncoupling it. Um, this is what you see with uh, KRAS itself. This is what you see when you inactivate KRAS. So it's an increased mitochondrial rate to start with, but also it seems like these mitochondria are already working at their maximal rate. So if you uncouple mitochondrial function, while here you see an enhancement in the KRAS cells, here you see an, uh, that essentially you had already uh, worked at the maximum rate, and this is the normalization of those data 
where you see essentially uh, these uh, reported on, on the same scale to be able to uh, detect the fact that um, while the KRAS cells can uh, still enhance their mitochondrial respiration uh, in the presence of uncouplers, you don't see this with the KRAS distinguished cells. So, um, and, and, and when you look at the energetic status of these cells, you actually see that in the science of KRAS, you can't really, uh, um, and if you add mitochondrial inhibitors, you are not able to sustain the ATP levels uh, because these cells are relying particularly on OXFOS for, for their generation of ATP, uh, while in the KRAS context, you are able to fully recover uh, your ability to produce ATP through glycolysis. And uh, so then the question that we ask is, is OXFOS inhibition synthetic lethal with oncogene exhaustion, and could we take advantage of this uh, to move things um, uh, towards translation? In fact, what we see is that the treatment with oligomycin for 24 hours in the absence of KRAS completely eliminates um, the remaining cells. And uh, that's what you see here. Um, if you do this with the signal transduction inhibitors, you essentially have the same uh, data. So this is, looks very promising from a translational perspective. Um, we have some initial data with oligomycin, which of course is not a drug, as and also has a number of uh, non-target effects when you, when you treat animals, for example, you very quickly induce seizures. So you have to be careful how you administer it. Um, in uh, uh, this protocol that we have developed, we actually see that we can actually uh, improve survival uh, upon uh, reintegration of RAS function uh, when we treat with oligomycin. And that's uh, the start of what we would like to do in this particular condition by targeting oxidative phosphorylation in this context. So what I am talking about is that uh, essentially uh, if you have a, a fully formed tumor uh, and you treat it with uh, signal transduction inhibitors, you're going to see, uh, you know, dramatic responses in particular tumor situations. And if you see this, um, uh, what we believe is that there are residual cells that rely on mitochondrial activity for survival. They are quiescent, and ultimately, uh, they will be able to uh, restore their function through regaining of some of these signal transduction properties. So what we would really like to do is targeting at this, at this level. Um, and what's really uh, uh, intriguing now is that uh, when we look at um, real human tumors um, in, uh, uh, derived from new adjuvant trials, um, so trials in which um, patients are treated with, uh, in this case, is gemcidabine in radiation before being operated, is that while you don't see much uh, mitochondrial staining, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, which is this one, uh, in the tumor itself, uh, before treatment, upon treatment, you see many more cells uh, having acquired mitochondrial staining. And we believe, therefore, uh, that this could be a general phenomenon of resistance to whenever, you know, there is growth inhibition, uh, impact on, on, on cell division, you might have an activation of mitochondrial function as a result of shutting down or signaling, and this could give an opportunity for treatment. In the remaining few minutes, I uh, just want to show you that we indeed have an oxidative phosphorylation inhibitor. Started it a project um, on uh, actually trying to discover inhibitors of if one signaling through a cell phenotypic assay. And uh, in, in doing so, we were able to identify inhibitors that are potent, potently potent blockers of mitochondrial uh, function. Uh, in fact, these inhibitors do uh, exert impact on HIF, but there is, as a result of decreased oxygen consumption in the tumor, uh, you do see that, that hypoxia is reduced. Um, it's in fact something that impacts um, um, oxidative phosphorylation because if you grow cells in galactose, uh, you will see that there is a dramatic sensitivity to the inhibitors. And we actually were able to do through mass spectrometry identify a physical interaction of these components with the, with the mitochondria. 
um, they have activity in, uh, in, in vivo, and uh, this is, for example, one of the experiments uh, with, with one particular compound that we have identified where we see a clear impact on, on tumor growth and uh, um, where we have uh, impact in vivo on hypoxia and HIF1 alpha that gets decreased as a result of treatment. Um, and we also notice a, a context of synthetic lethality in cells that have, uh, and tumors, cells that are derived from tumors that carry uh, uh, inactivation of enzymes of the glycolytic pathway, DCSA, uh, in particular, is an enolase deficient uh, model or a PGD deficient model. And when we treat these models with inhibitors, we see very clear um, induction of uh, apoptosis and in vivo, uh, we see dramatic tumor regression. So um, um, the same applies to situations where you have uh, a highly hypoxic context. We see this in, uh, in, uh, in leukemia. This is a collaboration with our leukemia group at MD Anderson, where we see that um, while uh, you know, normal uh, CD34 cells are not significantly affected by the inhibitors, we see incredible uh, impact in terms of uh, reduction of proliferation and induction of apoptosis in the, uh, in the blasts. And uh, um, in, in fact, so we're thinking about multiple opportunities here, uh, again, in the context of really wanting to apply these agents in, uh, uh, to tumors that uh, reveal themselves as being hypersensitive to mitochondrial inhibition. You can think about tumors with glycolysis deficiency. You can think about the combination with chemo and, uh, or the piatri kinase MAC inhibitors that I described before, the leukemias and the formas in which you have a highly uh, um, hypoxic phenotype with, uh, with the overexpression of if one alpha. Uh, the definition and linked to particular uh, genetic alterations. And uh, as well as something I didn't show you, we also have data in uh, combination with ra radiotherapy. It all goes back to this concept of synthetic lethality uh, and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and the uh, importance of understanding uh, the physiopathology of tumors. Uh, you know, I clearly do believe, like, everybody else about the importance of the genetics. But again, this has to be brought back into the context of the kind of things that both Bob and Steve before me were talking about when looking at the tumor as, a, as an ecosystem uh, or it's in its own merit. Um, just to talk about the, the team, this is my own laboratory that's worked on, on this uh, project. These are our collaboratories, collaborator, collaborators in the pancreas. Uh, um, cancer disease team. Uh, Tim Efernan has been my collaborator for years in, in developing functional genomic screen. Alec uh, um, has been a, a, the guy that developed this model and we stayed in collaboration. The work, all of the metabolism work has been done in collaboration with Costas Riciotis in, in Luke Andley's lab. And uh, of course, Ron uh, is, is a dear friend and collaborator as well. And the Oxfos project was actually led by Joe Marslek and Emilia Di Francesco da MD Anderson. Thanks very much. Thank you. This concludes <coughs> the first session. We're going to take a break now until 10.30. And we'll pick up at the start of the second session. Our first speaker on the second session will be Wade Harper. Our next speaker is Dr. Steve Geek.